So hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of CFO 4.0. Um, so a really interesting uh, interview today. So with me today, I have Rajesh Gupta, who is the CFO of Oak North Bank, which is a really interesting new finance, well, I won't say startup, but a new financial services organization and a new bank. And we all know that there's um, a lot going on in that sector at the moment. So, but before we jump into that, firstly, welcome Rajesh. Fantastic to have you on to, on the show today. Thank you for having me, Anna. And so tell us a little bit about yourself, because um, you've uh, you've had a really interesting career, haven't you? Starting from what is a very big traditional corporate through to um, a new, um, you know, new and innovative um, financial services company. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up at Oak North. Yeah, I think um, I, I started my career uh, in the in the early 90s in, in India with a subsidiary of Al- Alcan, which is the aluminium company of Canada. And, uh, and uh, in 94, I joined uh, General Electric onto one of their leadership training programs called the Financial Management Program. Uh, and that program and working with GE over the next 21 years uh, took me across um, four different countries, uh, you know, India, US, Czech Republic, and the UK, uh, across seven to eight different businesses. And and also, you know, part of the stint was on the manufacturing side of GE, and the rest uh, of the stint, about 15 years, was with GE Capital. Uh, so you're right, Hannah, you know, I spent time uh, very much in a very, very large conglomerate at that point in time. And uh, I think when you, you always come to a stage in your career when you're thinking about, you know, what gives you the most satisfaction. And, and I felt like, you know, uh, getting into a role uh, where you can get your arms around everything that is going on, which is probably the opposite of what happens in a very large organization, uh, would be somewhat uh, somewhat interesting uh, for me. And it felt like that's what would keep me, uh, keep me quite uh, happy with my uh, day-to-day role. And the opportunity with Kensington Mortgages, uh, which was acquired by Blackstone and Sixth Street, uh, came up in 2015. And that felt like a good move from uh, a fantastic company like GE into uh, into a place where I could think about how I can build my career with a much smaller business, but where you know I could see 360 degrees of everything. And that went very well for four to five years. But I guess the nature of a small business is such that uh, after a point in time, you feel like you're not adding value and you feel like you're becoming part of the uh, furniture, so to say. And then you're like, okay, hang on. Uh, Am I really the right person for the next phase of this business or do you want to do something different? And fortunately for me, the Oak North opportunity came along at that stage. And what was very interesting about Oak North was it's, it's, it's also, uh, uh, at that point in time, a startup that had become quite successful, but was still small enough to get my arms around it. But at the same time, it had very, very big ambitions. So the opportunity of working with a group that is very successful at what it does, but there is opportunity to do a lot more, a lot more in terms of ideas, a lot more in terms of business models, plans, and growth. I think that's what attracted me to Oak North. So here I am, 18 months into my role at Oak North. And obviously, 18 months in, what do you wish you'd known before you came into the role? Uh, to be very honest, Hannah, there isn't, a, uh, there isn't a, a lot that I would say that, you know, surprised me when I, when I took on the role uh, at Oak North. I think uh, it was quite an... Uh, interesting experience from an interview perspective. I met the two founders. I met a number of people on the board. I met a number of the colleagues that I would be working with. Uh, the previous CFO was well known to me. We had worked together in GE. So I think I, I felt like we went through a process of uh, of getting to know each other, if you may, uh, in a very, very detailed way, much more detailed than pretty much any other uh, on any other uh, interview process that I had been through. So I had a pretty good sense coming into the role of what to expect from Oak North uh, and, and what my role could play out to be. And so, and, and fortunately, uh, I would say that pretty much everything turned out uh, in, in broad terms to be what it expected to be. The detail, of course, is somewhat different. So I don't think there's anything I'm sitting here today and saying, oh, I wish I'd known about 
this this particular aspect of things. Uh, of course, the one thing I would say is that, and this is not an Okno thing, is we live in a very uncertain world, right? So uh, getting into this role, uh, the interviews were at the beginning of when COVID-19 was hitting us and no one had a view of where the world was heading. And we got through 18 months, 24 months of that. And now we are moving into an environment that is looking at stagflation and possible recession and things like that. And these uncertainties, I think, are becoming part and parcel of what every business and every professional has to deal with. And often you hope, like, you know, these uncertainties stop coming at the pace at which they are coming to you. So you can at least try to build something with some level of confidence as to what tomorrow is going to look like. Yeah, I, I think I don't think you're alone in that thought. To be very, very honest, I think there's a lot of CFOs, you know, not just those listening to this podcast, that are sitting there going, "Yeah, we'd we quite like a little bit of normal, just six months. It'd be quite nice if we didn't have yes. some massive global emergency or global drama to deal with. It would be lovely, wouldn't it? Yes, um, to have that as part. So, and and that's an interesting piece because obviously going into a new role right into uh whilst not a, a successful new startup which is very different i think to getting in right on the ground you've got a bit more wiggle room to to enjoy yourself and get uh and, and, and you know play with business models and things um but you know with this volatile environment do you how do you approach it you know what are some of the, the challenges that you have perhaps hit and have you coped with with all of the things that are going on at the moment yeah, I think I think whether it is Oak Note as a business or whether it is me as a person, I think the one thing that is 100% certain is none of us can call what the world is going to look like in 12, 18, 24 months, right? Because every attempt at trying to say this is what things would look like uh, is going to result in a wrong answer. But more important, I guess, that puts you into somewhat of a speculative bucket which is not what we what we are trying to achieve from a day-to-day business perspective. So I think uh, one of the things that Oak North has done really well is we have this approach of looking at the world on a forward-looking basis. And, and forward-looking basis fundamentally means that we, uh, at a very, very detailed level, as we go through our portfolio, we would look at scenarios that could play out in the next coming 12, 24, 36 months. And we evaluate all of our client business models on the basis of those scenarios. And we are then able to then say, okay, if X happened, this is what would happen to the client. If Y happened, this is what would happen. If Z happened, this is what would happen. Making sure that you're looking at a wide array of scenarios gives you a kind of sense of what the bookends might look like and where things are likely to play out. And you're able to come up with strategies that are a bit more educated than trying to take a one-dimensional view of where the world is going to head out. And I think just like Oaknote does that in the way we manage our business on a day-to-day business working with the client, that's exactly the approach I kind of take, whether it comes to my primary job of stewardship, where you are you're facing that challenge in terms of people, right? You're always thinking, what could three years from now look like? And how do I make sure that I have the talent and the team that can actually deal with that kind of situation? When I look at my job in terms of ensuring that there is enough capital and liquidity in the business, I'm thinking exactly the same thing. What is the range of options that one needs to play out so that you can be relatively safe? No one is 100% safe. But if you can be saved to a, you know, 95%, 99%, I think that is job well done. And, and you want to do this in a way that you can pivot and flex, right? Whereas things change. And so this forward looking thing is not ever a one, you know, you do it once and then you revisit it in three years. You're doing this, redoing this constantly. You're looking at it every time. Okay. So what happened last month? How did things change? How am I going to, what does that mean in terms of how I've been thinking about the future? And that process of constant scenario analysis, constant keeping an eye on what is going on in the world around us and what it could mean for tomorrow, uh, is probably the way to cope with this kind of situation. Uh, I am not, I think from a tools perspective, it served uh, the company and it has served me quite well so far. So I think uh, I think that's kind of how I deal with things. 
Yeah, no, and it's great. And I'm hearing more and more um, that people are getting into, like you say, scenario-based planning. And then that rolls into scenario-based budgets or dynamic budgeting, as I'm hearing that term used a lot more, which, you know, and, and I guess what are the, without, you know, one of the things we try not to talk about is specific tech, but what are the tools and the team capabilities that you need to have that kind of scenario-based planning model in place? Do, you know, um, how do you approach it? Yeah, I think I think you. This is probably the one point in time when you have to really look into the external market, and you can't keep looking inwards into the business to figure that out, right? So we would look at a range of different economic forecasts from people like the Bank of England, Moody's, and there are many, many people. And we'll we'll also go down deeper, right? So if I'm looking at commercial real estate, we would look at, okay, what do the people in the industry think is going to happen? We're thinking about hotels. We would think about what is the hotel industry thinking about. Within the hotel industry, we would ask ourselves the question, oh, how are thinking people thinking about in places like Mayfair versus how are people thinking about it in Manchester or, or in rural parts of the UK? So you ask, you keep, you keep trying to get a lot of external information on uh, how people are thinking the future is going to play out. You're constantly looking at that information in relation to what is transpiring on a month-to-month basis in reality. Because the one thing we know is that no one ever gets forecast right, right? So you keep looking back at reality and saying, okay, does this reality and people's forecast, how does that kind of start matching up and, and how do you play that? And then you fundamentally take those pieces and you try to uh, clearly, I can't do 30,000 different scenarios. I mean, that's just a waste of time. I think I'm confusing myself. You want to pick up two, three, four scenarios that can help you figure out what is the bookends within which you should operate. And you're looking at the key drivers of the business. So, for instance, for a financial services industry, the drivers may be what do you think might happen to your net interest margin when you play this? What do you think might happen to your credit losses when you play this? And what do you think might happen to your growth when you play this? And then across those scenarios, you're looking at those primary two or three drivers and trying to understand, okay, A, B, C, this is how things could play out. And then you determine, okay, what is, how am I going to manage my business? How am I going to manage my talent? How am I going to manage my costs in relation to that particular piece? So we try to keep it relatively simple, Hannah. You know, there's always the possibility to go very, very micro on things and lose the big picture. Uh, But we would try to do this somewhat more uh, so broad enough to get the bookends, but uh, simple enough so that, you know, we can actually understand at a senior level what we're looking at. Absolutely. And and then in terms of planning, like you said, team and talent um, in that, because that's always an interesting piece, isn't it? You know, knowing you need to kind of plan for the talent that you're going to need, but then you need the funding to pay for them to be in place. So how do you balance the need for growth, which is, you know, as a fast growing uh, business in a, in a startup esque world is really, really important. How do you balance the need for growth? Um, and obviously the talent that goes with that, with the current volatile environment that we're currently sitting in. Yeah, I think I think lots of different facets to that, right? I think when you look at some uh, a place like Oak North, I think we have been using a few different tools in that context. Uh, the, the basic tools we use is we, we have, for instance, across all of our functions, talent that is based in the UK and talent that is based in India. So that gives us access to two markets to go get the resources. And, you know, our India operation is not like it is a it is an outsourcing service. Uh, it is an extension in many ways of our team that we have in the UK. So there are times for certain roles we may find great fit within India. At other times, we may find great fit for that role within the UK. So we are a little bit more... Uh, relaxed about thinking uh, where you hire people from. It really depends on the quality of the people that we that that we come across. So that's one thing. The second thing is uh, the easy way to up to make sure you can get the skills is find the people within the existing team with the potential and put them on appropriate training programs and exposures so that they can learn more. And and one of the things that you know when I came into Oak North, I saw. Uh, it was a function of us being a small company that a lot of people were doing lots of different things, right? And in some senses, it was good because everybody kind of knew a little different things. One of the negatives of that was 
people were not really becoming expert at certain things. So we're trying to reset the balance a little bit more so that everybody, uh, we want to retain the opportunity for everyone to know everything that is going on so that they can be broad in what they do. But I'm also insisting that people go deep in what they do. So if you are doing, you know, supporting the business partnering team, your job is to make sure you even go to the market with the salespeople and you understand the client in a, in a proper way so that you can actually get the context within which you are uh, supporting your business partner and the context within which the business can be uh, can run in a much better fashion. So deepening the experience of people, making sure we are putting them through the right training is the other piece. The third piece is it's never perfect because uh, for me to say what Thailand I need in 2024, I need to be able to say this is what the business looks like 2024. Now, as we discussed, that's going to be difficult, right? So we look at maybe bringing people from lots of different places so that I have diversity of talent not in terms of the experience that we have. So uh, Oak North already had a couple of very strong people within the finance team. We've then gone to an investment bank, Goldman Sachs, actually, and we got one of our key finance people from there. Uh, We went, we got another one of our key finance talent from Barclays. Uh, This was a gentleman who worked in the Barclays, had done some work with the ECB and also done work uh, previously with GE Capital. So we got that kind of talent set. And the existing people had also worked in both banks and non-banks in previous lives. So I'm basically building... A team that has done different things, and and each when I I know that when something new comes up, one of the four or five people would have had some experience with that. So sometimes before you decide you're going down a definite path, it is best to have the people who have had exposure to different things. So we are building a leadership talent that is very diverse in terms of the experience they come from, as opposed to you needed to have worked in a retail bank with these kind of experience, can I take the experience set? I like diversity of experience and I think it brings benefits that you can never plan for, uh, but they just happen as a matter of course when you have that kind of team. Uh, of course, uh, my team is nicely split between uh, between uh, people who have worked internationally in lots of different places, uh, people who have simply come from a core finance background, uh, people who may have started their career somewhere else and then walked their way into finance. So uh, it's it's a good blend and a mix of people that we have. That, I think, is another way to deal with how you bring talent on board uh, without necessarily a fixed final destination. I love that. And it's something I've talked about quite a bit on the show is actually diversity has more than one meeting. I think we talk a lot about the traditional definitions of diversity but actually I love your approach to diversity of backgrounds because especially financial services that's not always the case is it there's a lot of people coming from from those those core banks and it sounds like you've really made uh, an you know an intentioned effort to bring people in with other types of experience which is fabulous and I'm guessing you're seeing the benefits from that as well as you as you grow and as you develop hundred percent. I think one of the things I learned in GE was don't hire people like yourself, right? Because I think very often when you're looking to hire people, you're trying to figure out, oh, does this person think like me? I mean, what is the value of someone thinking like me, right? I mean, I need to have people who think differently from me uh, in my team. Uh, not, not, not. 180 degrees different, but at least they're bringing in completely different perspectives, right? And, and 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 being open enough to know that the world has got different shades and let's not stick to black and white and, and lose ourselves uh, in that particular process. It's a great piece, I think, around risk minimizations, isn't it? Like you say, having people that don't think in the same way or perhaps have, a, have had a different experience in the past that they can, like you say, look at things differently and also identify risks that you may not have considered from the same piece. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any other benefits that you have personally seen in terms of having that diversity of background as well, in terms of the impact on finance and maybe the wider organization? 
Well, I think it does make the team environment somewhat interesting, right? Because you've got people who come from different places. They have got different experiences in life. You know, even when we get for a drink around the table last night, last evening, I was out for drinks with three or four of them. You know, people come up with the kind of stories and the kind of experiences that they had. You'd never have if you went with the same uh, type of almost, uh, oh, this person fits the, fits the scatter and then has you know, has had similar kind of experiences. So uh, I think it makes the team environment as well a lot more fun in my experience. It's like balance though, right? Because when you bring, if you bring in a lot of diversity, one of the things you can create is a lot of internal conflicts because people are thinking about things so differently from each other that it's very difficult. So there is a, there's a balance there. I think you want people who think differently, but whose foundations are all somewhat similar. Uh, attitudes have to be very similar. They have to have an open mind to when people challenge them, right? And in finance, that happens a lot. We, you know, we get paid to challenge things, right? Uh, but the way you challenge can end up, you know, rubbing people emotionally the wrong way. Uh, or you, the way you challenge can actually be seen as other as, ah, I had not thought about it. I would rather have a lot of people who can uh, drive that kind of feeling in whoever is talking to us, you know, ah, that's an interesting new perspective. Let me think about it. So I think it's never, it's never perfect, right? Hannah, as, as pretty much everything in life. Uh, but in, in general, uh, if you can get to 80, 90% of that perspective, I'm getting a lot of good ideas coming in and the team is able to function as a single unit, uh, with some common values and common philosophies. Then I think you, then then I think I've done my job. Absolutely, and I think you're very much underplaying the power um, your your ability because conflict is a huge piece, isn't it? Especially with diversity of backgrounds, right? So people have different perspectives, um, and I and I think it's a really interesting point you say that even though they've got diversity of background, they have a shared a shared set of values, a shared attitude towards challenging. Um, and out of interest, have you ever had anybody come into a role where you've had to coach them into being able to challenge more effectively in a, and in a way that doesn't create that conflict within the team? And how did you approach that? Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, I think coaching works both ways, right? Uh, it's uh, quite interesting that, uh, in, uh, 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 you know, I've had experiences where, of course, I've had to sit down with people and explain to them the impact that they're having on others. And, 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 and to be very sure that people have thought through whether as a result of them uh, using a certain style, they're still getting the outcome they intended or whether their style is actually detracting them from achieving the outcome that they intended, right? And I think that is the whole play between, uh, are you clear on what you're trying to achieve with this conversation? as opposed to you just are just putting in your style in there and and uh, the outcome is not something you're really focused on so i think it's a it's not, at a senior level you don't sit and coach a lot but i think you ask the questions and the team you're hoping that the team is intelligent enough and smart enough to figure out okay let me just think about it and let me adapt my style and what i've seen is once you give people the clue the direction uh, they find the answers themselves. And I think that's a lot better than me telling them what the answer looks like. But coaching can work both ways. I mean, when I when I came into Oak Note, uh, I still remember an experience where one of my direct reports called me and said uh, I, at one meeting that, listen, uh, I felt very upset with the last meet, last call we had. It felt like you were saying that we were doing rubbish all the last 24 months. And I said, well, that was never my intention. And she said, well, that's exactly how it felt to me, as you were saying. And then I had to step back and I had to say, okay, hang on, I have to be careful. On one hand, I'm trying to drive a better way of doing things. And in doing that, I need to be very conscious about the uh, effect I'm having on uh, people who had been there for longer than me, right? And I did, I did make a conscious effect to, you know, uh, adjust the way I said things to make sure that my objective was to move forward, not throw mud at what was happening uh, prior to me there. And, and you have to be thoughtful. And so I definitely both give feedback to my team, uh, but I also invite a lot of feedback to myself. And I think uh, that that helps us all move forward in a better way. 
the fact that a team member such you know quite early on was a felt like they were able to to step up and say that is a is a great sign. You've obviously took the time to build those relationships even at that early stage, um, to to enable them to do so because that's that's a hard thing for people to do. Yeah, well, some of it is me, but I would in this case give a lot of credit to the team member who was confident and courageous enough to uh, you know come up and say that to me. So. Uh, of course, you know there are some people that I know you would I would never approach and give them feedback. So you need to know that the person is going to be receptive to it. But ultimately, the person giving feedback is always, in my mind, the courageous person because you are taking a risk when you are doing that, uh, not knowing exactly at the end of that conversation are you better off in a relationship or are you worse off, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard, isn't it? It's it, you know, giving feedback, even if you're giving it to one of your direct reports, there's always a bit in the back of your mind that goes, yeah. "How do I make? How do I not damage the relationship when I give this piece of feedback?" Yeah. And and I've observed this, you know, sometimes, and different people take it differently, right? Which also doesn't make this easy for a team, uh, for a manager or for a leader, you know. And you know, you have a good forty five minutes conversation in which. 44 minutes you spent talking about how great the person is and then the one minute in which you gave the development feedback and then two months later you're having a chat and the only thing the person remembers is what was said in that one minute and and you're like okay hang on that was <laughs> that was one out of 45 that wasn't everything and, uh, and but you know individuals I have learned take things differently and as a as a leader, you have to constantly calibrate. There is no management book. There is no management training that can prepare you for the idiosyncrasies of the people you work with. And everyone is different. Yeah, it is a, is a it is a challenge. And out of interest, you know, obviously we talked about you developing. Do you have is there is there particular books that you read? Where do you get your development from as a CFO? Do you have a coach? What's your approach? So. Uh, I, I think I was very, very lucky that in the uh, 20 odd years that I spent with GE, uh, I was sent to a number of leadership, uh, you know, training programs and courses. Also, I think GE had a set of leaders that were very, very strong in the way. And, 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 and it was amazing how well teams worked within GE. So I think the combination of all of that did, did, um, did help me quite a bit in terms of, uh, in terms of how you go uh, and how you how you interact with people. Because coming into a career that was not my core strength. Uh, I'm an accountant by profession. I started life thinking about things very black and white, and it took a long time to think about. Okay, hang on. It's not all about black and white. It's about uh, the relationships that you're able to build that is going to ultimately determine. Uh, your success and frankly your legacy right when you when you leave the when you I think to some extent you measure things by when you leave the business what kind of relationships you're leaving behind uh, as much as uh, as much as uh, how it worked on a day-to-day basis and 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 so I learned through all of that I mean I do uh, I have learned from books as well fair to say uh, I, I quote very often this book called the goal that I read very early on in my career, uh, which which kind of was very very, you know, there's a I heard very recently a Zulu saying, which fundamentally says if you if you want to get somewhere fast, you go alone, but if you want to get somewhere far, you need to take your team with you, right? And I think that stuck with me, especially the second part because in every business your intention is to go very far, right? But the but the but the uh, day to day feels like ultimately what you're trying to do is get there fast. But no business survives by just going fast, right? It needs to get really far as you go through. So that I think was a very powerful thing that stayed with me as I went through things. Uh, I also give a lot of credit to a book I read called "The Difficulty of Being Good," and and that very much focuses on things like, you know, when when people make decisions, when people do things, most of, most people do it with the right intention and with the right objective. But very often, some of those, you have unintended consequences and results play out differently. 
And it's very easy with hindsight to look back and say, you know, that should never have happened. That's that's the easiest thing we can all do, right? Because we all love, we have perfect knowledge at that point. <laughs> but being able to put yourself in the shoes of the person at the point they were making the decision, I think is also very, very critical. And uh, and I think in my, in my mind, uh, that book uh, helped give me a lot more perspective and be a lot less critical when you see mistakes happen and actually, uh, and actually understand uh, whether there is anything you can learn from the mistake you can take for the future than sit and worry about who made the mistake and, uh, you know, should they be part of the team and so on and so forth. It's tough. Hindsight is an amazing thing. And like you say, when we're giving feedback, we tend to do it from the perspective of having hindsight. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I love that. That's 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 a great piece of work and two great recommendations. So I've just finished a podcast. We launched it um, a couple of weeks back on great summer reads. So now I'm, I'm kind of in the headspace. I'm looking for, <laughs> for great inspiration. So that's two, two books to add to the list um, of recommendations. So, cool. um, so we've talked a lot about obviously team development and we've talked about diversity of background, but obviously with your shift, you know, all of your work that you're doing in GE through to your work at Oak North, um, you're, you're working with a lot of teams across continents and across uh, different countries with different cultures. So, how, you know, if you, how do you balance that, that shift in both culture um, and, and, and also obviously um, across country? How have you managed um, and do you find any big differences between teams out of interest? Yeah, I think, you see, I, I, I'm very, very fortunate, right, Hannah? I grew up in Mumbai. Uh, it is probably a melting plot like none other. And then I come and spend the last 20 years of my life in the, in London, which is another massive melting pot, right? And, and, and when I think about, and I enjoy these cities, right? Because, because it has, you don't even have to look for diversity. You don't even have to look for cosmopolitan. It's just there and it's uh, at your face. And I think consciously or unconsciously, as you work through that, you always know that people come from different places. And I think you're automatically tuned in to understand, okay, where is this person coming from? And it becomes a lot easier because of that background. I'm pretty sure that if I had grown in a, uh, grown up in a small village in India or even a small village in the UK, my ability to think broad would have been very difficult. Um, we, both me and my wife, wanted to travel the world and see places. It was just something we had in our mind. And now when I look back, that was probably the inspiration for, uh, for being able to, uh, being able to work across different, uh, uh, aspects, different cultures, uh, different areas. You, you look at even, you leave us across cultures, right? You even look at, an insurance company in the UK versus a bank in the UK versus a retail shop in the UK. The cultures are so different and, and you always have to be conscious about it. I, in a weird way, I find the cultures across continents to be, uh, to be a little bit less, uh, different, but the cultures across industries uh, are the one that I constantly, uh, you know, struggle with because people have very, very strong opinions and set views of how to do things when, depending upon which industry they have cut their teeth in. That's a really interesting point because Oak North, obviously, as a, an established startup, has I guess could have a startup culture, but it come, but it's obviously in financial services, which is that traditional. Um, approach so you know how do, how do they manage to balance the two and oh have you got a mix of the two i think i think a lot of credit to the a lot of credit to the founders i would say because uh joel and rishi they they are the founders they came into financial services without ever having worked in a bank before right so it was incredibly courageous for them to take the step but they also surrounded them with people with good experience in banking but who were frustrated with the way that currently banking is being done on an ongoing basis. And so people who wanted to do things differently. And that combination of people coming in with a very fresh idea, the founders who are very, very customer focused, and it's more about solving client problems. And then you have the set of people who have worked in 
uh, industry for years and have seen, you know, things that could, that work well, things that don't work well and being able to bring the two together. Uh, ultimately, I think what unites pretty much everyone in Oak Note is that customer uh, aspect because the North Star is always the client. The North Star is always the customer. It's not some internal uh, stakeholder that we have to we have to satisfy. So we've talked a lot about obviously um, Oak North being that startup, um, but also within the financial services sector. So the other thing I was going to ask you: How do you balance obviously the regulation element of being in? financial services and obviously being a bank with the the growth requirements that come with being a startup um so what's what's your secret i think i think to be perfectly honest i think when you really think about what the objective of regulation is it is about making sure that you're very very aware of the risks that you're taking and that you're managing the risks in an appropriate fashion, right? And and while you're a startup, I think, uh, once again, the mindset within Oak North is always about getting the right economic answer. And the right economic answer always takes into account what is the right, what is the right level of risk that you're taking in what you're doing. So I would say to a large extent, uh, the at least the philosophy uh, behind the regulations that we are following uh, actually helps the business run better. Now, I wouldn't deny the fact that there are times when some aspects of regulation uh, don't make complete sense because, uh, from an economic perspective because regulation is developed for the broader market and may not always apply on a micro basis to every single business and every single product within it. But to be perfectly honest, in those situations, you just have to bite the bullet and follow regulation, right? Because you operate within a set of rules, you operate within a set of uh, requirements within the geography that you follow in, and you stick to it and you make sure that uh, that you're working within the guardrails that are set up. Uh, Oak North and other companies would from time to time, when we find things that are not quite appropriate for the way that a fintech is operating or a new company is operating, we would go and talk to the regulators and we would talk to industry bodies and others about things that we think are probably not appropriate for today's time and age. And through those kind of conversations, we often uh, get a good audience with the regulators. Uh, Sometimes it may not be just the regulators, right? It is uh, government policies and things like that. And and we do get a good, we have a seat at the table. We do get a good hearing. Sometimes we get the change we hope for. Uh, sometimes the change takes quite a long time and sometimes the change doesn't happen. Uh, and that I suspect is how uh, every regulated company uh, operates uh, in a sensible way. But I think we are very clear in our minds that uh, risk management is important to get to the right economic answer. And when there are regulatory guardrails, you have to operate within that. You can try to influence them, but your job is to operate within them. No, that's great. And so my last uh, final question for you. So obviously you've come into um, Oak North as a, as a new CFO. Um, w- looking back, what um, if you think about obviously the journey that you've been on, what recommendations do you have for anyone starting a new CFO role um, in you know, their first 12 months? What, what are some of the key things for them to think about? Yeah, I think, I think in a CFO role, there are, um, it's very, very important to make sure that you understand the stakeholders you're working with. And, you know, the, the number of stakeholders you have are, are, are huge, right? I mean, there's obviously the CEO who is your number one uh, person you're supporting and partnering with on a day-to-day basis. There's the rest of the exco who's looking at the CFO to make sure that they can understand whether what they're doing will get to the right objectives of the business. Uh, there's a board who's looking at the CFO, both from a perspective of commercially advising them on the right things, but also as the steward of the business to raise any concerns that the CFO has uh, with the board. The regulators have a very similar mindset where they're looking at the CFO and CRO to make sure that we are asking the right challenging questions as we go through. So there's a huge number of stakeholders and not always with the same agenda. And the CFO 
uh, has to be able to uh, have the have the ability to bring things together and and influence that when you balance all of those different stakeholder requirements and different stakeholder perspectives, you're moving in as aligned a path as possible. You're never going to get everybody to agree on everything, but as long as people are comfortable that we are moving ahead with the uh, with the right thought process having been in place, right awareness of the risk, and we are monitoring the things that could go wrong really well, I think you do quite well. So the CFO has to be aware that there are lots of different stakeholders and they have to take everyone with them. And then the second piece for me is always around people. You have to have the best team around you because without the best team around you, without a team that you can trust, without a team that you can uh, that you can simply uh, delegate aspects of day-to-day to, uh, a CFO is going to get lost in the detail and in the granularity and, and not able to step, the, uh, you know, do the step back and look at things. Uh, I think in, in, in the CFO role, and I've, I've been victim of this many times, sometimes the CFO wants to know the details so much that they start doing it themselves, right? And, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with doing that at the learning stage. But as you go through uh, the length of your career, you have to make sure you have a team that does this. And your job is to step back, look at it and see, does this all make sense when you step back and look at it? So those would be the two things I would say. One is understand your stakeholders and figure out exactly what is the right way to make sure that everyone's aligned in the direction of travel. And then the second thing is make sure you build the best team you possibly can. Great tips. Well, thank you so much, Rajesh. It's been a fabulous to talk to you today. Um, and if people want to learn more about Oak North um, and Oak North Bank, where's the best place to, to find you guys? So uh, we, we have an uh, excellent website and uh, you will see that being a bank in the UK, uh, we do publish our annual accounts out there and we try to describe in our annual accounts the philosophy of the business, the values of the business, how we run ourselves, what is our secret sauce, and of course our performance and, and why we are good at what we do. So I think that would be a fantastic source for people to uh, get better information. Uh, they can always uh, connect with uh, myself or with Val or others in the business. We tend to we tend to be relatively open and transparent about how we uh, how we. Um, think about uh, life in general and our clients and customers. So, uh, you know, we would be very happy to have a conversation if that's of help to anyone. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Rajesh. And for anyone that's interested, I'll pop obviously the website link and a link to Rajesh's profile in the show notes. Please do check it out. And thank you again for joining me. It's been a a bit of fabulous session um, talking all things startup, fintech and, um, and culture as well, which has been fabulous. Yeah. Thanks so much, Hannah. Take care. Thank you. Bye.